And with that, we push the big red button. It's two o'clock central time, central daylight savings time right now. And we are live on drama. Happy Friday. Happy Pi Day. I never know what to do with that. Happy Pi Day Friday. <laughs> well, good afternoon, whatever we want to call the thing. It is Friday afternoon, and we've gotten together for another episode of drama. Man, do I look washed out in my feedback screen let me know if uh, it looks as bad to you as it does to me i'm going to flip a light off here and see if that makes a difference <clears throat> it looked so good when i was doing rehearsal <clears throat> so i've turned it off it'll take four seconds for <laughs> six seconds for it to turn up yeah about the same i guess it's just really really bright on my right side so I keep this light on on my left side to kind of make an evenness and hope that the uh, the camera will auto adjust for brightness and contrast. So yeah, there it is. It looks like what it looks like, right? Excuse me, I got a little bit of a frog. <clears throat> and <laughs> I don't know if I had it all day. I'm working in the house solo today. There's been nobody to talk to, so I don't know if I've sounded like this all day. I sound like a clever lad joyfully chomping on a slice of apple pie. What joyful lad would be joyful about chomping on apple pie? It's a raspberry pie show. And it is that. <laughs> I'm watching all kinds of good stuff happen here. All right, well, let me go uh, fire up thing. This is Pie Day Friday. We, uh, I am Dave Rush. I'm the senior instructor at, <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Scott. I'm the senior instructor at Total Seminars, where I don't do a lot of instruction these days. Uh, so I do fill in a lot of other uh, responsibilities and tasks and funness and get an opportunity once a week to come on and do this and kind of break up the monotony. I'm really pleased about that. We do get together once a week to talk about all things CompTIA, especially A+, Network+, Security+. Uh, and we try to incorporate Raspberry Pis into those environments for those of us who are locked down and uh, can't do continue our studies in our normal modus operandi before all of this corona covid stuff came to be and so we you know we do all kinds of things we make uh products and projects out of raspberry pis to use as study aids for comptia sometimes we just do fun stuff sometimes we do general learning and foundational stuff basic linux things like that and uh, today we're going to do uh, a project that kind of touches in both worlds. One, it's going to touch in all three worlds of A plus, Net plus, Security plus, and to a lesser degree, ITF plus. Uh, we're going to build an email server, and that's going to require that we have an understanding of a number of ports and protocols. And also, we're going to build an email server because having your own email server is just a pretty darn cool thing. And being able to do it on a Raspi with, after everything, after you buy a Raspi, whatever model you want, this will work fine on a Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, depending on how many users you're talking about simultaneously accessing. Uh, and a power supply and a case and a memory card, an Ethernet card or a, an Ethernet cord maybe, but you can do Wi-Fi. And so on the bottom end, you're in for what, 40 bucks, 35 bucks if you go Pi Zero, and 70 bucks if you want to do everything well up with a, a good Pi Four. You can't do that. You can't pay two months worth of time on an AWS server, maybe three, and build an email server there for that same amount of money. This will run for years. So, ton of fun. All right, let's look in now. Yeah, let's go see who's here. Not too many. We can get caught up pretty quick. Hello, it first man in. Many thanks. Nice to see you, sir. Scott popped in a little right after to greet him. Ellen Duggins here, 1156. Hey, everyone. And hey, Ellen, right back at you. <laughs> we have three people talking. Oh, here comes a few more. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Today's special project, according to Scott, is installing an email server. Well, that was up in the air up until last night because I have just had a murderous project that uh, I'm still not done with uh, that I promised I'd have done for the company by Friday. I'm very, very rarely late on uh, 
project delivery schedules, but I am behind on this one and it's very related to a last one that I did. I was a little late on that one. So uh, because of that, I haven't had much time to do any prep uh, and we'll see how that manifests itself in a little while. I'll tell you more about that as we continue. Andrew Hutz is here. Yo, 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 yo. I did a yo, yo, yo reference on Discord. I saw nobody follow up on that. We'll talk about Discord in a little bit. 3D print your pie cases, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. Um, I have 3D printed three of them. I got one up there in use and it's held down by a rubber band. I guess the other two are upstairs, uh, but you can, uh, there's a wide variety of cases you can print uh, 3D for Raz Pies from very min minimalist to super exotic. Well, all right. So again, I am Dave Rush. I'm senior instructor here. I am joined in spirit and in keyboard by my partner in Pi, Scott Jernigan, uh, finishing up what we call the uh, the last of the first rights of the N10008 new Network Plus book. He's going to come. He and Andrew Hutz has been working diligently on completing the uh, the glossary updates and culling and whatnot. That'll get turned in today and. I believe the last chapter of first rights then has been turned in and the last this is the last item of first rights after that things come back and they uh, they've gone through a, a grammar style and content editor and they go through an, uh, another editing process a tech editor we have a, a wonderful gent uh, PhD electronics in one of the New York universities who double checks everything we say technically and uh, he sends those back to us, and then we have to check and see if if that's an edit that we're we're happy with or that we need to address. And it's a it's a really involved process to write a book. And Scott and Mike um, are the primaries on that. Mike does much of the writing. Scott does much of the writing, and then Scott does almost everything else. So he really really hammers the time and still pulls two hours out of his week to join us again in in keyboard right now. But he's here. He wants to hear from you. Ask questions of me. Ask questions of him. Just post them in the live chat. If you're not watching the live chat and you want to talk to us, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can accomplish that. Uh, if you're watching this uh, after the show is no longer live, you're watching it on the archives, uh, you can communicate with us by email. If you're watching live and you don't want to communicate with us uh, on the chat because you've got a long message, because you're shy, because whatever reason, you are most emphatically encouraged to contact myself or Scott or even Mike Myers himself, the big man, uh, via email. You can catch us. I, we all work at Total Seminars. Our website is totalsem.com. And our emails are first name and last initial. So we're pretty easy to figure out. I'm Dave Rush, therefore Dave R at totalsem.com. Scott J for Scott Jernigan over at totalsem.com. And while I don't have it up here, Michael Myers, right? Michael M at totalsem.com. If you want to talk to Mike, you can also send me uh, an email on my personal email address at to my, at my, whatever your, the correct grammar is. I'm D Rush T uh, TX. I'm David Rush in Texas at Yahoo. You can try and call the office. Nobody's there, but uh, somebody answers. We we forward it to one of our administrative personnel uh, during the day. And if you've got a crisis or something like that, I've got to talk to Mike. My test is tomorrow and I haven't studied. <laughs> he may not be able to help you. And then again, he may. So you can always do that. Uh, I'm always looking for, uh, or we're always looking for more YouTube subscribers. So please like and subscribe to the channel. If you're watching this on the archive, you can do it then. You can do it now. Uh, you can do it anytime from the time that we have it posted as an upcoming. We usually have those posted anywhere between one and three days prior to the, uh, the Ask Me Anything, the AMAs. We do call this drama, Dave Rush, Ask Me Anything, but it's more accurately uh, considered dramas, uh, Dave Rush, Ask Me Anything, and Scott. So, Please consider Scott a full participant in this. I'm just looking to see if you have anything else on there. I don't. So close that out. Come back to face. Shrink that down. All right. Who else popped up while I did that? Oh, that was Avanat who said, 
have not. You just, I think I saw a very similar name in Discord uh, the other day, right after Mike's show. So I, I believe you may have joined. And if not, please join us on Discord. I'll put up that uh, link information in a couple of minutes and tell you all about what we do there. Uh, Majdi Daifa. Hello, sir. Nice to have you on board. Andre is here. Hey guys, ready to send and receive email. <laughs> no, ready to receive, ready to send and receive mail. Yes. I sent a little padded envelope mail out the other day to somebody back in the Midwest. US Postal Service rates are all the same no matter where you go. Uh, put a couple of stamps on it. I think I only needed one, but I went for safe and sorry, safer than sorry, and uh, picked up the mail today. And there it was back to me two days later, note from the post office, return to sender. Now I never went out. The, the stamp wasn't canceled. I contacted the person that I sent it to and uh, took a photo of the, the mailing address that I used and sent that to them. And they said, no, that's right. So we don't know why. The post office returned that to sender and it seems like a big hassle to go to the post office and ask them so i'm going to send it another way heck with the post office let you ups or fedex have my money even though it'll cost 30 times as much right <laughs> scott says yep that's me jason helms is here matey you haven't missed anything yet I want to make my case out of Legos. You would not be the first, amigo. Maven Feliciano, good to see you, my friend. X-Wing fighter pie case made from Legos or logos. I have a question for Mike on Wednesday. I had a question for Mike on Wednesday, but perhaps between you and Scott, you may know the answer. Can a blue screen happen on a virtual machine? Sure. Um, remember, it's just Windows. And once the virtual machine gives over the resources to Windows. That's regular Windows drivers in there and Windows programs and Windows everything. And Windows gets to manage and use its memory in the way that it chooses. Hypervisor says, I'm gonna give you this much memory and here's the boundaries of the memory that I'm gonna give you. Uh, that's the only thing that's not virtualized. You actually get real honest, not, not the only thing, but one of the few things. And, uh, so sure, whatever could cause a copy of, of Windows to blue screen could copy could make it happen on a real physical computer or within a virtual machine. So salute me. Um, I hope that answer helps. I hope <laughs> you're not encountering that problem. And, but I suppose it's also more possible to blue screen within a VM then outside, nah, nah, too many variables there. That's not a fair statement. Okay, Mr. S is back studying for core two. Yeah, we know you passed core uh, one. I remember giving you congratulations on that on Wednesday. Uh, when are you taking that, bud? Let us know. Uh, greetings, my favorite nerd caller. The herd heard the nerd. SKT, S SK Total Wellness, got it. I know somebody who's in the wellness industry, a former boss of mine, bleh, 27, almost 30 years ago. Uh, and I saw Total Wellness and I immediately started going through his initials. No, okay, you're not him. <laughs> That'd be interesting to, to see the old boss. He was an old friend too, so coolness. So greetings, to, uh, SK. Mr. S, is MAC addressing work on both wired and wireless connections at the same time? Wow, okay, that's a very convoluted question. There was a time in Windows that if you have both a wired configuration and a wireless configuration, the wired one would override the wireless one, you wouldn't have any wireless access. Of course, wired network interfaces have MAC addresses and wireless network interfaces, Wi-Fi cards have MAC addresses. And they're the same style MAC. They're both 
48 bits, and they're basically both Ethernets. Uh, they're assigned by IEEE, and the first 24 bits are, are assigned, and then the manufacturer gets assigned the next set of bits in there. Le earlier to mid versions of Windows 10 allowed simultaneous operations of both devices. And so certainly simultaneous Mac operations can happen. Um, somebody can be ARPing to your physical Mac address, your hardwired Mac address, while somebody else, uh, maybe you, it doesn't matter, somebody else, you are using your machine to perform uh, some kind of ARP process or RARP process. Uh, and those, there's nothing that prevents those from happening simultaneously. So let me go back and look at the, the, the syntax of that question. Is MAC addressing, we'll say does MAC addressing work on both wired and wireless connections at the same time? Yes, on current versions of Win 10. If you're using both of those interfaces simultaneously. Okay, about a week or so, Mr. S. Great. Uh, thanks, not encountering, just and curious from the hiccup from the stream. Okay. Yeah, I saw a bunch of missed questions on Wednesday. Sorry about that. Mike gets wrapped up, and when he super scrolls, sometimes he doesn't go all the way back up. Because we all love YouTube with, with its magical super scrolling thing. Patricia Gray says, all the adapters will have a MAC address, physical address, Wi-Fi adapter, Ethernet adapter, Bluetooth adapter. Uh, so yeah, that's true, Patricia. Uh, I, I think the nature of his question is, can they use their MAC addresses for operations simultaneously? Hey, Dave at Tullowit. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not everybody knows that, Patricia. You're posted 214 to Tullowit. And Chief Nerd. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I will kind of accept that there are nerdier than I, I hope. Mr. S trying to set up my wireless devices and wired devices on my router. Sure, I have that all over the place. I've got a wireless printer over there, my Wi Fi router, I've got uh, wired connections coming out of there going to a switch, feeding all of these devices on my desk, and there's wireless connections. And sure, and of course, the 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 wireless and the wired aspects of the router are working simultaneously. They, they all work with MAC addresses. Uh, let's see, Jason talks to Tullowit and Mr. S. Thanks, everybody. Good. <laughs> Tullowit, I'll be good once the coffee kicks in. Yeah, well, you're the guy who just got up and has to kick in that coffee. All right, I'm caught up on questions. Let's see what's happened here in my background and back channel. Good. Oh, my. Hey, the, uh, the Zapto server is up, the Pi R Square server. I've got today's uh, notes and archives in it. Let me post that real quick. Oh, it's not that. Now, heck, I'm just going to type it in manually. It's easier. Okay, so I just posted a link to pyrsquare.zapto.org and whatever the current time mark is, 216, 217, something like that. Um, most everybody here who uh, knows what I do with that thing, but if you're watching this on archive, maybe you don't. I keep an archive of all of the documents that I use when I do one of these presentations. So my outlines and my pictures and my PDFs and other notes and things like that. Uh, so if you want to use those to follow along with uh, some of the projects or see what I'm talking about, or uh, if English isn't your first language and I speak fast and mispronounce words because I speak fast and mispronounce words, uh, you can go to this web server. Uh, I only keep it open full time right now on Fridays when I'm where we do the show. It'll be up till I go to bed tonight, probably about midnight uh, U.S. Central Time. But uh, it's got all the archives of all almost all the shows we've ever done. There were some shows we've done that didn't have projects, so I didn't archive that. And if you're uh, if you want any of that stuff and it's not Friday, you can have it. Just kick me off a note on Discord or 
to my email address that I showed at the beginning of today's presentation and say, hey, I need it. And you tell me when you need it. And I'll uh, kick up the server, turn it on for a few hours that day or whatever. And you can download what you want. And then I'll kill it. I do not have it secure enough that I'm comfortable to leave it run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's, it's, it's a, an involved project to self-host and be secure. And I'm wondering if the uh, crash that I had two weeks ago might have been because I had some very poor security on some of my other port forwarded servers. Uh, right now I have no port forwarded servers as I go and, and re-examine those capabilities. Hard to tell what happened. It, it could have just been a hiccup, but it could have been something more malicious. Uh, so I mentioned Discord. I may as well cover that ground too. There is a Discord server, a chat server. It's got text chat, it's got voice chat and video chat. And uh, it's called the unofficial, <clears throat> excuse me, Total Seminars channel. Scott, if you would post the link for that. And meantime, I will throw up, no, I won't throw up, uh, visual presentations of a couple links that'll get you there as I tell you all about this. Got to go over here, here, and here. And if Scott doesn't hear me, if he's working hard, hey, that's kind of cool. Hold control to select multiple windows. We'll do that as an experiment in a little while. So there's a couple of different links. Uh, there's like eight different ways to get links on there, and they're all a little different. The, Scott, the one that Scott posts that he researches will probably be different than one of these whatever. Uh, and like I said, if Scott doesn't hear me and post one, I'll post one of these. Uh, so this is called the unofficial Total Seminars Discord channel because it's not official. We have nothing to do with it at Total Seminars. We didn't create it. We don't run it. It was made by our great friend, Jose Braden, uh, who's online on Wednesday and so I'm uh, online on Discord the other day. He's a very busy guy. He took the time to create it and he was very uh, heavily participatory in it in its early days. And then uh, he's appointed moderators, and he doesn't get much of a chance to get on himself. Uh, but we get together on there. There's four, over 400 people uh, who are regular members of it now, and all kinds of different forums and sub forums on there. There's Cali forums and Linux forums and study forums and help me fix my computer forums. There's a Raspberry Pi forum and zillions of others. And people who are on there out of that 400, 24 hours a day, some very, very smart people uh, who, if you've got questions, they can help answer. They can work with you. If you've got answers, we would love for you to join up and answer other people's questions. And uh, we get together and, and just talk sometimes, usually right after the show, my show today on Fridays and Mike's show on Monday and Wednesday, one or more of us will get online with mics and cameras and we'll just uh, shoot the breeze with everybody else who does that. And we hope you'll join us in doing that. We can talk about tech topics. We can talk about uh, the weather. We can talk about your favorite recipe, whatever. We're very flexible on that. Language is a little more salty, we'll approach a little more salty on there with some people, not everybody, you certainly don't have to be. Uh, I will be there on the show uh, after the show today, about 15 or 20 minutes afterward, maybe a little quicker. I got to do a little put together here and I always have to catch up on things that pile up while I'm doing the show. But we'll be discording and hope you'll join us. And Scott has posted uh, links at 222. Now, if you use one of those links and it says the link is expired, you can still get in. Just look around on that page with the, the notification about expiration. And there will be some link on there that says continue, a, continue anyways or something to that effect. And you'll be able to get in and join us. And by the way, if you don't have a mic or camera or you're not comfortable using those, come on over anyways. Uh, you can type while we're chatting. And of course, you can type anytime you want and text to it. My camera and hoodies. Oh my gosh, Jason, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> That's a, an unfortunate inside joke. Sorry, I'm not going to share it or explain it but perhaps uh if you're not familiar with it if you're not a regular on on the discord channel right now come online and ask somebody about it and they will explain it to you for sure <laughs> uh Tullowit is doing another scanning day there's something you can find out about Tullowit has an interesting uh occasional job that he does called scanning 
and I'm not here to explain it for you, but if you come over to Discord and you tell what's one of the guys who's on there uh, 24 hours, except for the three hours a day that he sleeps, I think, uh, he would love to explain it to you. SFTW scan for the win. I don't know what SF, oh, SFTW for the win. Oh, scan for the win. Okay, I got it. Uh, I'm slow. It wasn't me, Andrew. <laughs> The other Andrew. <laughs> well, aren't we all just having too much fun, Mr. S? Reading messages. Sunny and Mango are here. Hey, guys, how you doing? How's the studying going? I love how you guys study together and, and share uh, an avatar and all that good stuff. You guys are a wonderful couple. Jason Holmes, you keep pitching them. I'm going to hit them out of the park. <laughs> Okay, it's true. Thank you, Patricia. Darn right. Y'all behave. <laughs> okay, I'm caught up on questions at 225. Hey, nice. Let's see what's in here in my handy dandy notes. I'm already way ahead of the game. Okay, Scott's moderating. We're here to advance technical learning a little while isolated during the COVID crisis. If you're tracking or care about any of this stuff, this is the 58th uh, episode of drama. And if you ever want to see all of them, you can just look at the, the top of the page that you're looking at now. Uh, actually, when you back out and you look at the, uh, the, the upcoming link on the, the just look at the, the homepage of YouTube slash user slash total seminar channel. And you'll see a link up there called playlist. You click on that and you'll see uh, one for Mike's shows. Every one of his AMAs that he's ever done is archived there and easy to find. And same thing right next to it. Uh, or I don't know, but we got one other guy on there who uh, has some playlists on there, who uh, does some stuff with us, but you'll see the, all the drama ones. You could watch them all from soup to nuts. I wonder, I've been wondering, we did an episode a few weeks ago. There was some kind of hiccups in that range. So I don't know if it was three or five or six, but whatever it was, uh, we did an episode on the current modern way of installing Raspberry Pi OS onto a Raspberry Pi. And it's, it's a little different then when Raspberry Pi first came out, and therefore the way that we uh, we did episode number one, which was your first Raspberry Pi, how to get a Pi and how to install the operating system on it. It was called uh, Raspbian back then. And it was a, a very different approach than how we do now. There used to be a uh, an installer program called Noobs, new out of the box software. Uh, and Noobs is gone. And so for anybody who's going back to that year old post, which isn't that old, people do that. And I will prove that today. Uh, it won't work the way they say. So a few weeks ago, we said, let's do an updated version of that, uh, how things are done today. And I wonder if, you know, I guess what I'll do, I don't want to pull it. I, I'm, I'm one of what Mike's, Mike calls precious poop guys. Once I've created something, it kills me to edit it or to change it or delete it. <gasps> Uh, so what I'll do is I'll make a change to it. I'll go to the descriptor on there that says noobs has been deprecated and there's a new and better way. See our episode on whatever that date is. Yeah, that'll be cool. I like that. So it is number 58. We did our one year anniversary six or seven weeks ago. Probably wasn't that far back. I've been so busy. Time just flies and flies. <clears throat> So I'm here every Friday, two o'clock for two hours. We shoot the breeze for 45 minutes or an hour. We do a project for 45 minutes or so, and then uh, shoot the breeze and close things up. That's roughly the, the format. It modifies depending on the nature of the project and the nature of questions. Mike Myers himself, senior author and president of Total Seminars, uh, best-selling author of millions and millions of CompTIA exam preparation books. Uh, he holds a, a one-hour live show here twice a week, uh, Wednesday at 2 o'clock and Monday, two days previous to that, at 2 o'clock. Goes for typically at least an hour and longer if the, the question load is high or if he has a, a presentation that he wants to do. Hope you can join him there. It's this very same channel. Uh, please do. He would love to hear from you. He likes your emails, uh, and he loves chatting with you on excuse me, the chat sessions here. 
Uh, reading questions. If you've got an in-depth, I did that. Hey, specials are back. And Scott, if you would be kind enough to post the special, I'll put a PDF of it up. Really, I will. There we go. That's where the, the thing is. Click, click, click. So this week, we do a special every week. Sometimes they change week to week. Sometimes they stay the same week to week, whatever it is. Uh, this week's special is uh, it's good for it started Monday and it'll be uh, good through this Sunday, the 12th, 50% off bundles. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Scott posted this link at or this information at 2.30. So we have 50% off uh, bundles that are comprised of an ebook and a matching topic set of total tester questions. Total tester is our online practice test engine looks and acts a lot like the CompTIA practice test question uh, environment. Uh, and you can modify it. It's, it's heavily adjustable. So you can say, I only want questions from this domain or from this chapter. Uh, I don't want it timed. I do want it timed. I want to get hints. I don't want to get hints. I want practice mode, which is a time test that has the same percentage of questions from domain one and domain two and domain three and whatever uh, that you're going to get on CompTIA. It doesn't have uh, simulations in there, but it does have uh, multiple choice practice tests. And we have those bundles available for A+, for Network+, Plus, for Security+, Plus, for Cybersecurity Analyst, Pentest+, and AWA, uh, AWS Systems Architecture Associate. Uh, use this code at the checkout. You go to totalsim.com, you load up your basket with loot, and then anything that's a bundle, you get 50% off on. If you put this in the discount window at the checkout page, 090621. That's the US format for the date this most recent Monday, September 6th, 21. And that's good through this Sunday, September 12th. Don't ask me what time. I have no idea if it's midnight or whatever, but don't wait till midnight. Don't wait till Sunday. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. And then you don't have to worry about, am I going to visit on Sunday? Be a totally different, something will be totally different about it uh, next week. Might be a different discount product, might be a different code. I don't know, but this one's available now. All right, back to my notes. I mentioned frequently for the projects that we do, whether or not this project can be done exclusively on Raspberry Pi OS and therefore Raspberry Pi, or if it's available for other Linux distros. Today, our email server is a very popular server that will run on most Linux distros, including Raspberry Pi and ARM-based ones, including x86-based ones, including Mac OS ones. So very flexible. If you haven't bought your Raspberry Pi yet and you want to try this thing, make yourself a virtual machine in your own system with, uh, I don't know, Ubuntu or Debian or whatever makes you happy and pretty much follow along this, the general same steps here that we would do on this. Where we've been, where we're going. Last week, September 3rd. Where are you? There you are. Uh, we did an exercise and went through all the steps correctly in duplicating, cloning a storage device, a micro SD card or any other storage device in a Raspberry Pi to any other storage device in a Raspberry Pi. And while we did all the steps correctly, and I've done it successfully here at the house, when we went and did it live on the show, it choked on the very last step where we hit the big go button, it choked. And we did a little research and it turns out the problem was my SD card reader. I didn't make it down to Micro Center this week. Again, busy, 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 and, and gonna be that way for a couple of weeks. So I finally ordered one online. I got a new modern updated one coming in. So not gonna demo to you. I also got the, uh, the script from uh, Mr. Quick, He's, I haven't seen him online yet today. Uh, and I haven't experimented with that yet, but when I get the, that SD card reader in and four hours of free time, then I will experiment with both of those things. So that was last week. 
This week, we're going to install an email server on Raspberry Pi. We're going to use an email server called Citadel, C-I-T-A-D-E-L. Uh, maybe it's C-I-T-I. -I. I wrote it down differently in two different places. Hang on. Let me go look at the Citadel site. I have it open in another link here. Z -z 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 home. Yeah, yeah, read my notes. Emeteria, what am I doing there? Oh man, did I say the wrong thing, wrong page? Not that I need it. Huh, okay. Well, somebody look it up. Oh heck, this one's a quickie. I'm looking it. Citadel.org with an A, it's email. Okay, so I had a typo here. Not C-I-T-I, C-I-T-A, Dell, email, save that. You'll have the typo in the downloaded archive one until or unless I get that updated today. All right, so we're gonna install an email server at Citadel. We're gonna use a tutorial. <laughs> Wasn't that wacky? I was doing some editing on this document just before the show. And I moved, there we go. Moved a reference to it. I'm going to put the link for uh, the tutorial that we're gonna use today on the chat right now, whatever time mark it is. Okay, time mark 2.36. And now I'm going to put this back in my document here. There we go. Okay, and of course, I'll tell you a lot more about that as we continue. <clears throat> News, tricks, and techniques of the week. I already told you about that one. You don't need to know. Uh, resource archive is up, pyrsquare.zapto.org. And it'll be up till midnight. Uh, I just have a little story to share. There was no really exciting Linux news or Raspberry Pi news on the week. But I, I have started a project that it, it's a Raspberry Pi project. And this is a, this is a, it's a, Things that happened to Dave's story, okay? This has nothing to do with upcoming projects. Maybe not, maybe we will. Um, but there's a project, there's, a, there's a, a piece of technology that I want to learn. It's easily operative. <laughs> That's why they hire me to talk. <laughs> it can be easily operated on all the standard Linux distros. And I thought, yeah, I'm gonna try and run this on Raspi. Has it been done before? Yes, it's been done before. Cool. So I went out and found a, a pile of tutorials and I started working on that. I got 30 hours into the project. 10 of those are rebuild a brand new Raspberry Pi OS installation and update and upgrade. Each of those takes about an hour. So I have at least 20 hours into this project. There is no tutorial that works right there. It looks like the product is changed so frequently and there's enough change in the last version of Raspberry Pi OS to this version that everything that they say just doesn't work. And I really wanna learn this technology it's a, a workflow product from Apache called Airflow. And uh, I have for the moment said, I'm, I'm giving this up because it's more important that I learn the product. It's important to me. It's not important. Uh, than it is that I learn how to install it on a Raspi. But I will not abandon that. I've got to. It, it's that challenge, right? It's, it's, it's Other people have made it work. I must make it work. 
and so I will. But in order to learn it, I'm going the traditional method. I'm just going to install it on an Ubuntu VM and uh, get moving on it. But man, just painful. And let me tell you about one of the painful things. I was doing a fresh install. Uh, it was one of the early ones. And uh, I pulled a, a card out of somewhere, didn't look like I needed it, and popped it into my uh, SD card reader slot on my laptop. And I went to clear it. And it was really weird when I ran the disk part utility in administrator mode, the drive appeared twice, disk one and disk two. And I was terrified that I wiped out that I would potentially wipe out uh, my main C drive. I'm pretty confident that I wouldn't. But if things are happening weird, they're happening weird. Now, I rebooted the machine and they both still showed up and said, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, we're going to do it. And I went and, and picked one of them and wiped it out. And well, while I'm at it, I'll pick the other one and wipe it out too. And it gave me a little bit of trouble. And uh, I had to do some heavy magic. I wound up taking that card out, putting it into uh, a Raspberry Pi using a another piece of junk SD card reader. And then I used a utility called Gparted uh, and wiped out any vestiges of what was there. And it still gave me trouble when I went to, to do magic on it back on my PC. So I put it back in. I used Gparted, installed a Linux partition on there, removed it, and then put it back in my Windows machine and everything was nice and clean. And Oh, goody. I got it all prepped. I turned it into what it was supposed to be, got moving on the other project. And I thought, well, anything weird going on here? Yes. I ran disk part again and the other disk was still there. Thought, what the heck is going on here? And I rebooted the machine to see if, you know, some cached vestigial, vestigial memory of it. And, now nah, there was disk zero and disk two. And then I found the problem. <laughs> I had put this in there, pulled it out of a machine, copied some stuff from a, uh, a computer that I brought home recently that I'm resurrecting some data from, put it in here, resurrected the data, and it was still in there. So it was disk whatever one or two, but it doesn't matter. I blew away everything that was on here. Now, fortunately, I know where it came from and what was on it. And there was nothing important. It was just a, a copy of Linux uh, that I was using for a lab that we did in here. In fact, it wasn't a Linux copy. It was a, uh, a file system for NextCloud. And we never put any actual data on there. So no loss, but wow, what a stupid mistake. If I had a live critical uh, flash drive in there, that could have been catastrophic. So give myself a reminder whenever messing around with that stuff, do a good physical once over on all the slots, what's in there and what's not, right? Where are we at here? 43. All right, all my notes are done. Uh, hey, let me get this one up here real quick. Andrew Hutz, who you see here online with us, and he works for Total Seminars now, working directly with Scott and other folks doing editing and other things. Uh, he has a great security-oriented blog. I'm posting that for you right now, whatever the current time mark is. It is 2.43. Uh, check that out. He writes some really interesting stuff. He's a good writer. He's an interesting writer. Uh, and his topics... Uh, if you're having any kind of interest in security, uh, penetration testing, stuff like that, he's got good stuff. All right, that takes care of all of my notes up to time to start the project. So let's get caught up on chat and then we'll do that. I left off at 2.30 with Scott's note. Crunchy ice. I love slushy ice. <clears throat> Joey Quetzal's here. Hey, what I miss? You haven't missed anything? Usual day-to-day -day basic questions that will come up. The project starts in about five or six minutes. Okay, Scott posted, as we said, today's specials at 
Jason Helms talking to Scott. Andrew, can I run this on a three? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's one of the really cool things. And I'll get into that more. Uh, email servers don't require a lot of memory or CPU horsepower. What they require is enough storage to handle all the emails, to hold all the emails of all of your prospective users. And if you're going to have a lot of prospective users, uh, maybe not a zero, maybe not the bottom of the bucket. Uh, remember, 3A came out. Well, 3A. Oh, yeah, 3K, 3A came out way after the B and the A and the first zeros. Uh, so, yeah, it would be fine. Simple email server. Maven Feliciano. I was watching Monday's stream and I heard him say there wasn't a 90 day period. Just to clarify, he also mentioned the ebook. So it's the ebook that's permanent, but the questions are 90 days. I don't think the ebook is permanent either. Scott is our guru on that. Scott, could you take a look at that question from Maven here? To tell you what, I'm going to post it in the back channel and you could potentially. give him a correct answer. I would be flailing here and it's out of my area. Scott's answering a question at 235. Part of the process of making a book is the page proofing. Layout happens after copy edits, <laughs> copy edits, tech edits, page proofing, layouts, first writes. And then Scott, and then the, the book gets printed, you know, however many copies in the first run, 250,000, 500,000, whatever it is. And then all those printed pages come back to Total Seminars and Mike and Scott uh, take pieces of, of heavy cardboard and they print the front and back covers and binding and then they hand bind each of those books. It's a, a many month process uh, because between the two of them, they can get about a hundred books done a day. So, <laughs> or perhaps I made all that up. But yeah, there's a lot going on making books. Lots. Jason knows maybe the book is yours and unrestricted. Test bank is 90. Okay, Jason's answering the question. Scott gives more details on the process of writing books. Total at 236. Pages have to be proofed. Once they double in size, they can be put in the oven for baking. <laughs> You know, there's only a handful of you and I, a handful of folks besides you and I, who understand the proof pun there. But okay. Yeah, there you go. Patricia Brace, Grace got it. And Scott did. Okay. Maybe there's more than a handful. There's only 16 of us here. Hey, it's 17 people. I only see six people who've clicked the thumbs up underneath the, the marvelous image of this gorgeous visage. So let's get that thumbs up thing plugged. I'm not making. Somebody thumbs down. Who hates me? That's such a wussy thing to do. I mean, if you got something, you got a problem with this, fine. Tell me about it. Contact me by uh, email, or post it in the chat, or do whatever. But you know, don't be a wuss and just thumbs down it because you're you're some hit and run thirteen year old idiot. I'm just gonna go to live things and thumbs down them. Oh, you know what? And of course, it could be somebody with a hoodie. <laughs> I'll bet that is that 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 other. 13 year old brain case. No, I shouldn't have done that. No, nah, he was just having a bad day, I think. And things overflowed. The wonk. What was that? Somebody's machine wonked. All right, reading along here. Jason Dome, just curious the process. Now I'm hungry. Yeah, we're all going to go start baking. I super scrolled. There's a little bit going on. Can Raspberry Pi, David Moen, can Raspberry Pi ever suffer from overheating? Well, David, it's like any other computer, um, suffer from overheating. Yeah, we did uh, a show where I, I talked about cooling and we did some labs uh, where we operated at regular temperature at close to max temperature or throttling temperature, which is 85 C on most of the models. Uh, so when it gets cl uh, close to or at 85 degrees, uh, the CPU slows down and therefore any programs that you're running will slow down. 
uh, that slowdown will cause it to cool down. And as soon as it cools down, the speed spikes back up. And then it gets really hot really quickly because it's already close to max thermal load. And it drops. And what happens if you watch this graphically, we, there's utilities. And I will find this for you. Uh, you'll see the speed go really fast. So there is, of course, now it won't go above that one. If you force it to go above 85, and that's pretty tough to do, then it'll just turn off the CPU. So you won't damage it. So when you say suffer from overheating, yeah, it'll slow down, but it won't die from overheating. I'm going to pull up the episode info on that cooling episode. Give me a second here because I got time. It's not in that one, therefore it's in the other one. What? Oh, not there. Two down, one to go. There we go. Four results. Mike turns to cooling solutions. Liquid cooling, liquid cooling. There we go. Cooling a Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to post a link here. We did this on April 16th of this year. And I think what you'll get out of it is something really cool, David. Uh, and that's the the utilities and graphical utilities that we use to generate a, a very high load and to graph it. So try that out. Check the link out. I just posted it at this instant time mark. There we go. 251. Okay, 242, Joey, I'm running Kali Linux on an old computer, which I rebuilt. It's safe to use the admin account as my regular default account, or should I create and use a separate account for regular use? Uh, it depends on whether the box is exposed uh, in such a way that it could get hacked. You know, the default account name and password for the administrator uh, on a, a, a Kali box, if you, know, if you just use the Kali image and install it, is Kali. Account name is Cali, password is Cali. Um, and everybody knows that. But if you know, if you're just using this in your house in your own personal lab, you're not uh, making it available for anybody else in your facility, in your home, or whatever, uh, or uh, to access it, or if anybody who would access it, as long as they're all safe, they're co workers and can be trusted, uh, you could use the defaults. But if you're not comfortable, if you think there's any chance that it could get hacked, then never use the uh, the default account name or password on any kind of system, Linux, Windows, or whatever, right? Yeah, for your regular usage, you should never use the root account or the Pi account or the Kali account. You know, if you're just talking about installing an application or running an application, whenever you use these power accounts, malicious code uses the permissions that your account has to perform their malice, to infect files, to commit atrocities upon your hard drive or whatever. Uh, Andrew Hutt's doing a new article this weekend too. You're welcome for the plug. Maven's talking to Jason at 244. Patricia, I'm eating ice right now too, sweet. Next project, Dave should go over the setup of an old school dial-up BBS using a Pi. I have to pull my rotary phones and my. Yeah, you'll you'll laugh. Scott will will nod his head saying, "Yeah, that sounds like Dave." I have uh, an old school uh, switch, telephone switch, and old school PBX buried you know deep in the guts. I haven't seen it in decades, but I could pull that out and make a tiny little phone company here. Yeah, we could do that. I would need a modem bank. Reading questions, ebook is a two year subscription. Maven, there you go. So it's good for two years. Thank you, Scott. Yes, like and subscribe. The thumbs down was from this guy in a hoodie. We must have said that at the same time. I was off page. Haters gonna hate. Yep. <laughs> you didn't do anything bad, Scott. It's all good. Oh. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, because once you've clicked, it's got it can't be unclicked or fixed. So don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Maven, thanks for clarification. Scott needs to be forwarded to Mike, though, so he doesn't make the same mistake. Oh, please. We correct Mike all the time. You know what he does? Nothing. In one ear, out the other. Because once he gets an idea, you know, it's like most of us. It's it's hard to dislodge. I do the same thing. Yeah, we're doing emoji puns. Usually Patricia does something or similar. There we go. Here comes emoji. I see. Well done. Master <laughs> V, good Lord. I know you didn't, Scott. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I have thick skin. Even if you did it, it would have been cool. This project that we got uh, this weekend, and I don't know where uh, what the direction they're going to make us go is, but uh, if it requires that uh, you toss an insult at me, do it. And likewise, I have no problem doing it with you because of the nature. If I say something about you, it's it's never something negative about you. It's never in truth. Okay, caught up, I think, on questiones at 2.53. Let's talk project today. So we're starting a multi-format, a, a multi-episode project. When I first looked at this as a project, and I thought about this close to a year ago, what are things we're going to do in the future? And hey, one of the things we got to do is make our own email server. Uh, it came with some biases, right? It came from the fact that uh, I'm not as old as Mike, but I'm pretty doggone close. He just has... Uh, a little more than a few months on me. So I, I've learned technology. And one of the the edicts about learning and teaching is things learned first are things learned strongest. There's some other things like that. Uh, so the way I learned about email servers, I understand very well. Uh, and it's 30 year old information. And things have changed a lot since then. And I try to keep up on these things. I'm I'm not a Luddite. I, I like new technology. I learn new technology. But email servers is not one that I've, I've spent a lot of time following and tracking the updates. The last time I did an email server was just a couple of years ago. Mike and I built an email server at his house for uh, a video series that we were shooting using his house as, as the studio. And we did it old school, the same kind of, of server that I learned about 30 years ago. So when I made the commitment a week ago, I'm going to do an email server. And then I started the research on, I don't know, Friday night, Saturday morning, whatever it was. And I got kind of a facepalm moment there that says, there's a lot going on in email servers right now. Uh, two major categories and then subcategories of either. So we're going to talk about uh, what we're doing here and, and why we're doing it. So let's start out with the project, uh, hardware required, a Raspberry Pi and the usual accessories, a power supply, a case. You don't ever need a case. You just have to have a case because you got bare exposed uh, circuit points on the bottom. And if you put this on something that's uh, metal, well, it'll be destroyed immediately. Or if it can fall or get pushed onto metal, uh, it will be destroyed immediately then. Uh, I did that in college one time. I had a a circuit board that we ordered for a club that I was in, an amateur radio club. And I was programming it in my dorm room one night. And it was on a, a nice uh, Formica, linoleum, whatever kind of plasticky, varnishy surface of a desk that was provided by the university. And I'm buzzing along, having a good time. And I got up and I, I shoved. And it went to the edge of the table, the desk, whatever it was, which had a metal rim around it, <laughs> fried instantaneously. And that was the day. You know, I've been doing open circuit boards forever and a day, and I still will, but I'm a lot more cautious about what could happen. And so, you know, case up your Raspberry Pi. If that means putting it on a piece of cardboard, that's fine. I've got a, a, an Intel NUC, and you see the next unit of computing uh, in my other room as my HT PC. Uh, that's in a, a little piece of folded cardboard uh, made out of a cereal box. This thing came as a bare circuit board. And so I cut it out in shapes and I bent up some flaps on the sides of it and taped them. And 
it's been running like that for three or four years now. It's pretty cool. You need a power supply, you need a micro SD. And again, we kind of talked about the capabilities of the Pi. If you're not talking about a lot of users, you don't need a powerful one, a, a micro, a, a thank you, a Pi Zero uh, will be just fine. I'm not gonna recommend the earliest Pi's that had 256 megs of RAM or 512 megs of RAM. I wanna be thinking on the order of a gig of RAM or more if you're talking about maybe using uh, making a, a server that's going to serve a lot of users. I'm looking at, at total seminars with our give or take 20 people on any given day. Uh, I would feel very comfortable with a, a Raspberry Pi, anything doing the job. But you do, of course, have to consider how many emails are you, they going to create and save on the on the server. And for that, you got to deal with an appropriate size thing. If you want to do it with a micro SD card, fine. Think big, 64 gigs at a minimum, higher, or plug in something external, an external uh, hard drive, an external SSD, a good size flash drive, something along those lines is worthy to consider. All right, there's your hardware. You can go Wi-Fi, you can go wired Ethernet, both, neither, whichever makes you happy, not neither. Uh, software. You'll need, of course, Raspberry Pi OS. Current distribution works fine. And then all the other software that we need for the project is going to happen and, and be explained as I go along. The project. Put up the link and show the email and the tutorial. I posted this email on the uh, chat. I'm posting it again. Here's the tutorial that I'm using. At whatever the current time is, looks like a minute after the hour or so. And did I make a slide for that? I know that I did because because I know that I did. Let's just go with that. Email server tutorial. There it is. So then you click this and you click this. And you're all kinds of background wonking going. Oh, when I know what that sound is. Somebody's playing on Discord. I've, we've had Discord links up. So we're using uh, electromaker.io as one of the sources. There's a lot of different tutorials for a lot of different projects on there. Uh, I did this project briefly last weekend, and I'll tell you why I picked it and the nature of it in just a moment. Uh, and I haven't done it since. I got a clean, fresh card here. We're going to do it raw and in the wild. And what this means is I don't remember how long it took to do each step. So we may wind up uh, running long. And if that turns out to be the case, if, if we had a long copy, or then we got a long copy and we'll do the rest of it next week. I'm planning this thing for three weeks and allowing to grow as long as four. <clears throat> I think I got through all of those. I sure did. Great. I don't need that document anymore. Okay. So when you're building a server or an email server, when you're building an email environment, there's a lot of options and issues that you have to take into consideration. Uh, are you going to have a standalone server with unsecure sends and or receive ports? So we could use old SMTP, we could use old POP and old IMAP. And I kind of like that because those are some of the ones, certainly for A+, that we have to learn and memorize. So we know that SMTP, uh, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, uses port 25. It's been a long time since I've reminded everybody of this. I'm going to make you suffer. Uh, there are three ways to memorize ports and protocols. One of them is rote memorization, right? Break out your flashcards. And that's a good start. All learning starts by rote memorization. Hear it, learn it. Maybe you hear it once, but it's so cool, you can remember it. Maybe it's the first time you ever heard SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, uses port 25. I'm not going to remember that. Fine, make a flashcard. The best way to learn anything, of course, is to use it, make a server, be the one who configures it, look at the menu options, and so forth. But for rote memorization, my favorite way to remember port 25 for SMTP is send mail. It's the thing that actually sends the mail out. TP25, P-H-I-V-E. Yeah, I know, it's weak, but it works for me and it works for all of my stand-up students, as well as you guys, I hope. And then we've got inbound ports and processes, POP and IMAP, POP port 110, IMAP port 143. 
I started by rote memorization. I moved to flashcards and now I use this stuff for years and years and years. And it doesn't take years and years and years, but as you do that stuff and as you teach it and you learn it and you use it, you get to know it. So that's a good reason to use an old school email server because you're going to practice with ports. Now we could also create secure versions of those. Uh, and some email servers will allow you to run unsecure protocols and or secure protocols. Again, I picked today's server because it has that capability, the Citadel. With this kind of email server, we can let the server run quietly, use traditional. Now, that's the, the, the one possible e eh about it. The kind of server we're going to use today, the old school server, is a quiet little server. It just sits there. It does nothing. And we've got to access it using traditional email clients like Outlook or Thunderbird, the very, very popular uh, open source email client. It's very powerful, very flexible. Now, another way to do this, if you want to create a cool email server that uh, you don't want to use because uh, you're learning CompTIA stuff or real world everyday network stuff, they make email servers now that natively come with a web browser interface. So you don't need a client. All you, just like uh, you would access Gmail, or Hotmail or Yahoo or ProtonMail or any of those other web-based email services, uh, there are web servers that run just fine on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, but again, it doesn't teach you much. So I didn't use that kind of approach today. They use the same ports. They use, no, they don't. They do everything on port 80 and 8080, uh, sorry, 445, I quit. 443, secure uh, HTTP. And so it doesn't give us any value for learning CompTIA stuff. Some email servers support add-ons. Like the one we're going to use today, I could add a web interface to it. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Scott posted uh, links at 305 to the ports and protocols document that we created. Myself and Michael Smyer and a number of other people were involved in that. Uh, it's got all the ports and all the protocols that you have to know for current A+, plus, current network plus, current security plus. And that dawns on me, Scott, I've been thinking about this for a little while. Uh, we're going to have to update it to make sure uh, there's no additions or removals from the new N10.008 in the next couple of weeks or so, whenever uh, net, <laughs> network plus, the new network plus, new exam officially drops and is announced. Uh, and then that document that you got the other day, uh, I'll create a draft document with any new information in that. And then when it's time to light that up many months from now, we'll do it. So you set up a web server, old school, web type interface, whatever. Now there's two other things that you have to do maybe three, depending on how you look at it, you have a decision to make. Is this going to be an internal only email server? There are places for those. There are companies, large companies typically, that have an internal email server not accessible from the outside world. You can't use it on the road unless you make some kind of VPN connection back to the office. That's kind of a cool thing. Uh, does a nice job in helping curb leaks. But if you do want it accessible from the outside world, you're going to have to take the appropriate steps. Uh, steps. Uh, have it join domain, uh, domain, use dynamic DNS, use a service like uh, from noip.com or something like that. And then you probably want to make it secure. You're going to not just use secure protocols, but you want to make your whole server secure. So you're going to want a certificate uh, from maybe a, a, a certificate authority like Let's Encrypt. That's what I do on both of those instances is, excuse me, with my Pi R Square Zapto server. It's got a Let's Encrypt certificate and it uses DDNS from no IP so that I could call it something, Pi R Square .zapto.org instead of its IP address, whatever my public IP address is. What did you just do there? There we go. Some emails, uh, some email, now this is kind of a weird thing. Some email servers, won't allow the server to be 
internal only. You can't access it from a client if the client has the same network address as the server. There's a fix for that. It, all of the, uh, the email servers that I experimented with over the years, just a little bit this week, uh, have another program that comes with it called an email relay. And you can configure the email relay uh, during configuration phase of the thing. And it'll be transparent to you and you'll be able to use it. Uh, but you won't be using the email server directly. But you won't know you're not. So that's kind of cool. So we're doing this old school Citadel one. It's very powerful. It's very flexible. Well, if you're hearing this honking and weep, uh, winking on my computer, uh, I apologize for that. It's the uh, it's activity on the Discord server. I'm not looking at it. But because of the way my system is set up, I hear it wonk every time. Okay, so over at the tutorial. Now, I, I gave you the warning. So some of this may go quick, some of this may not. But we're going to use the tutorial here. And if we just follow the steps, there's only a few. First thing, as with anything, whenever you're going to install a new program, you do a sudo apt update and a sudo apt upgrade. Now, remember, if you're uh, answering CompTIA questions, they don't know about apt. They know about apt dash get. So if you ever run into apt get, uh, that's what you're going to see on CompTIA. Apt and apt get are very, very similar. Some minor differences and some minor intended differences in usage. But all right, let me give myself a connection to my freshly installed copy of Raspberry Pi on a fresh Raspberry Pi. I used a 4B, not because I wanted all the power, it's because that was what I was experimenting with all week on that airflow project. And I said, stop, make it go away. Let's do something different with it. Yes, wake up, dear. Okay, now we share. And there she is. You could do this also uh, with a uh, an SSH connection. You don't need the graphical connection. I just like you to be able to see this stuff. So I've already done update and upgrade today. I haven't done anything since then. So the first thing we're going to do is to set up a, a an installation package. So we're going to sudo apt install. And then after here is a list of programs that are going to get installed and uh, essentials. I, I've curl and a couple of these are already in there, but we'll just hit the big enter key. There's not too many there. Do you really want to do this? Yes, I really want to do that. You can see Y is capitalized. And that means if I hit the enter key, that'll be the default answer. So I hit the enter key and we start waiting. And while we're waiting for that, see, I'm going to stop the share because it's just going to be a list of things going on. I'll keep an eye on it in the background. <clears throat> Progress, 11%. It's already zooming right along. And let me get my net, my nets and perhaps my notes set up for the next thing. Now, one of the things that we did there is install, if, if it wasn't already installed, the curl program. There are tons of ways to go out and get programs from sources. One of them is with apt install. One of them is a program called wget. With wget, what you do is uh, you create a, somebody creates a server that has the files that you want to bring into your Linux distro. Uh, maybe it's installation files, maybe it's text files, maybe whatever. Uh, and it's on a web server, it's just on some downloadable folder in the web server. And we do wget and then a path to that folder. Curl is a similar kind of thing. Somebody out there has to create some files that we're going to download. We'll use the curl program to do the download from a web server and then do something with it. All right, well, it was quick. It's already all that... Uh, apt get or apt install stuff is done. I'll show you this when I share it, hang on. Share this to you. There we go. 
So I got some notes about here. This is kind of an interesting note too. Uh, after I did my installation, I didn't do anything. It's a fresh, shiny new Raspberry Pi install. Uh, obviously, I, I made some adjustments to uh, the size of the text screen here in the editor, so you can see it kind of, sort of, and whatever. But it says, hey, I, I did some installations, and as a result, there's some stuff that you don't need anymore, and it tells me how to remove that. It's one of the nice things about apt. And I'm not going to read all that. I was looking to see if in here there was a message about you've already got curl, but I don't see it. Okay, going back to copy paste the next command, the curl command. So curl, go get all the files from this web server, HTTP easy, and notice that it's not even HTTPS. Easy install citadel.org, whack install. And then when you get whatever's there, run it through the bash script editor, interpreter rather, with sudo. So, okay. I don't recall that being a real big, ah, what are you doing? They've changed something since Friday. Man, I love getting burned. I should have run this this morning. I was up early. Curl. All right. There's no reason pseudo should work. Head title move permanent title head syntax error near unexpected token. All right, let's look and see what's going on there. Maybe we can run this command our own way. We're going to fire up a browser. This is real world. I've talked to you about this before. Linux is the wild, wild west. Uh, it's not Windows. It's not polished. It's not beautiful. Uh, it's good. It's powerful. But there's a lot of stuff that you got to do all by your lonesome. Did I hit that? There it goes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to this website. I don't want to do curl. I want. First, we're just going to go to the main page. Copy. I just want to do regular copy here. I can do copy. No, I don't want to copy the URL. I want to do a copy. And then we'll go over here and we'll paste that in there. Really, we will. Boy, this thing is dragging. Sorry, guys. Okay. Your browser doesn't automatically redirect you. Ah, look at that. So the old link said install, and now it wants to take us to easy install. There's a little update here. Login your system, following command, or if you don't have curled, we... there's something kind of weird about this, but I'm going to double you get it. The result will be the same. Okay, we W get a couple of flags, easy install, install. I think it's going to have the same problem. Yeah, easy install is unable to create multi directories and user locals. You forget to run install command as root. Hey, we got it. Open the easy install running. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> so we beat it into submission. <laughs> uh, I will update the uh, archive document when I'm done with the show. Uh, so hang on for, uh, you know, till tonight to download, or if you've downloaded it already, just download it again uh, sometime tonight. I'll leave it run for the weekend. <laughs> that sounds terrifying. But now if we follow along with this same tutorial, you'll eventually see a prompt to accept Citadel's terms and enter to continue with the install and you'll be queried whether or not you'd like the script to install 
additional packages. Let's just perform the installation steps now over here by saying, I'm going to type in the whole word yes. And here's the license question. Do you accept the terms? Yes, I do. And it says enter Y or yes to accept. And they got a capital Y, so I'll use a capital Y. This is a new installation. It will now begin. You want an easy install to attempt to install your OS dependencies. Yes, I do. And this is where things are usually the longest because oftentimes the programs like this, there's lots of dependencies. We got to, do you want to continue default Y? Yes. There we go. Buzz, buzz, grind, grind. All right. And I will kill that so you don't have to get bored watching all this. Though it's truly fascinating, right? <laughs> How are we doing on time here? We're 20 minutes after. Should be good shape. And while all that's going on, when all of these are done, when all these dependencies, dependencies are uh, programs and utilities and uh, files, configuration files and things like that, that the program needs to run. Uh, you'll see that all the time whenever you do uh, any kind of Linux program installation. Um, I'm trying to think there's some other times that you see it. Uh, one of the the things that's not supposed to happen is let's say that's got 50 dependencies and later on i load another program and it says oh good you've already got uh five of the dependencies that i automatic that i use too this is uh this used to be a real problem in windows it's a rare problem in linux now but it does happen because what happens now let's say i get rid of that first program i don't need it anymore if it takes out all the dependencies that new program may miss some of the dependencies that it was counting on there before. And you'll see that when uh, you try and run the program, it says missing dependencies or something like that. And if you ever see a program that's missing dependencies, very simple, uninstall it, sudo apt uninstall program name, or run an uninstall script or whatever it may be, and then reinstall it and it'll say, hey, I don't have the, the dependencies I need, and it will download them. Hmm. I did a copy and paste from that original document here. If you're following along in that document uh, over on the Electro IO page, uh, I just got a typo on it. Similarly, installation process prompts you for enter an admin password. So perhaps we'll change that to two. And this is going to get kind of interesting. The, the text in there is a little confusing here. Once this is done, it'll say, now it's time to configure Citadel. You'll be asked to enter a username for the admin user. Okay, so note, there's an admin user. And by default, the admin user has a username. It's called admin. And then on the next paragraph, it says, now the installation process will prompt you to enter an admin password. The default password is Citadel. And good to know the right spelling on that one now, C-I-T-A-D-E-L. I'm going to keep those defaults intact. If I were setting up a production email server, I certainly wouldn't, right? Makes sense. All right, so we've got an admin name and a password. Then the next one, once you've set a username and password, you need to pick a user for Citadel to run under. It's a different account that you've got to have and it says uh, the default user is root. And somebody posed this question earlier, uh, as I said on a forum that I was using today. No, it was today. Never use the root account, and especially in, in Res Raspberry Pi OS, because it's not by default enabled. You got to do heavy magic here. But never use the root account to do anything other than heavy administration that requires the root account. Uh, so what we can do is one of two things. We can use an existing account that's already been set up in your Raspberry Pi, like Pi, or you can make a new account name and password for them. And that'll be your day-to-day -day user. And we're not talking about uh, the kind of user who use the email server. You figure there's a run under, yeah. So we'll get there. How are we doing here? 90% on the database, 93 and cranking up. 
Uh, and it's downloading a database. It's not a common database like SQL or SQLite or Maria or anything like that. It's installing a Berkeley database, Berkeley DB. The next thing that's going to ask us, we can just kind of talk through this while that thing's doing its thing, is we have to pick an authentication method. That means when I authenticate to the email server, what's the method going to be? And it's going to give us four choices. Two of them are directory uh, accesses, uh, LDAP addresses, so or LDAP information, like you would use if you were going to integrate this into a Windows domain. We're not going to use those. Host system integrated authentication. That's a whole nother project and process and learning exercise. Uh, not anything that we need for certainly the trifecta of stuff. So we're going to use option zero, their first one, self-contained authentication, which is basically going to be give it the username and the password. Now, the next question is going to ask us, there's going to be a, a user interface to administer it, and it's going to be a web-based user interface. If you install this on a server, that already has a web server running on it, Nginx, Apache, web server, uh, whatever. Thinking of your different, different platforms, there's some different email servers, uh, web servers. That's okay. But what's gonna happen is those web servers are gonna be using port 80 and port 443 for uh, authentication. I'm sorry, for web access. And that's cool. What they're telling us in here is if you do that, then set up an alternative port for these ones. And of course, anybody who accesses it and uses it is going to have to use the alternative ports. And they recommend something that's very common. Uh, the unsecure HTT port, they say instead of 80, use 8080. And for HTTPS, instead of 443, 8443. 84, that's a typo. Should be 8443. Another bad one in there thing. Say that. Uh, I'm setting it up on a brand new shiny fresh Raspberry Pi installation. So there is no web server on there. It's going to set up its own web server and it will default to 80 and 443. And that's just fine. I could install uh, a, web, a, a traditional web server on here later if I chose. I could use alternate ports on that one. I could use standard ports on that one and change this one to alternate ports after the fact. It's all fine. Once this is done copying installing, we're done. The server is set up, well, it's installed. Then we have to do two levels of configuration. Uh, one of them is gonna ask us some questions here uh, with a little menu set of common stuff and then we're going to access it using its web user interface and complete the uh, the installation or the configuration and it's it's all pretty simple stuff i thought i had a list of all the questions it's going to ask here eh. just dragging along filling in stuff I'm not, I'm not sure how much longer this thing is going to go but i know it's not going to go past our time limit so I'll tell you what i'm going to let that thing copy and I'll move this over here. I'll check questions and see what's popped up while we're doing biz here. All right, a little bit of activity happened here. Oh, I'm, I must have gone way backward, all the way back to emoji puns. Okay, 253 is where we left off. <laughs> I like the catastrophe one. Browser crash says Andre had to restart and log in again. That's new. Never did that before. So why do browsers crash? Usually mine crash because Scott puts me to shame on this, got to tell you. Uh, I have usually two browser uh, 
two browser sessions open, right? Uh, uh, control T on there, not tabs, control N for new. So uh, one of them has 30 or so tabs open. And the one that I use for these presentations has 10 open. So I've usually got about 40. I think Scott usually has about 140 tabs open. Uh, and it's a miracle. Of course, he, he runs 128 gigs of RAM, so he can pull that off. And uh, I think he's got dual Ryzen 9, 9 series. But uh, I crash occasionally on browsers. But it's always a nice thing. I, one of the, the great things about almost all the browsers today, but you guys all know I love Bra uh, the Brave browser. Ooh, something else I can tell you about that too. Uh, is if it does crash, when I bring it back up, it either comes back and reloads all the uh, tabs or sometimes it's a really heavy crash. Uh, it comes up blank, but you can do control shift T and it'll say, oh, these are all the ones that got closed when it crashed. You wanna open them all up? Yes, I do. And I do that on each of the open sessions and pff, a couple moments later. Now, one of the, the cruddy things about that is some of them don't refresh. So I usually have to do a 10 minute exercise, go to this first tab uh, and click reload and then wait around until it starts to reload and then go do that on the next one and the next one and the next one. That all takes about 10 minutes. Uh, sometimes you really have to wait for the whole page or most of it to load. Yuck but price you pay for using browsers. Let's see, Scott retracted a message at 305, ports and protocols he posted at 306. Greetings, Elbow, long time no see. Glad to see you again, amigo. Yeah, we got, okay, I knew we had to update for N10008, the uh, ports and protocol glossary. <laughs> Casually dropping by, Elbow, asks Maven. Oh man, everybody missed you. Look, you guys checking in. Uh, day off because of a family trip we're taking later tonight. Wonderful. Have a good time. Have a good weekend. Hope you're in a place or going to a place that's got great weather. Uh, I can make it to Discord noise again. I can make it do the Discord noise again. <laughs> it dawned on me. I, I gave away a bad secret, right? Anybody who wants to... Uh, make my my computer wonk all you got to do is go over to the discord page and do a, a, a post on the general page yeah that's not the page i'm on <laughs> very nice schmuck reading questions passing 312 look at what my raspberry pi desktop looks like if you haven't played with that change desktop sometime too it's kind of fun i always keep the same one because it's familiar to everybody Uh, read, compile, read, compile, read, compile. All right. Hey, that's what my okay. I said that's that's what my Raspberry Pi desktop looks like. Okay. I wonder if there's a way to create custom Discord sounds for certain events. We could totally make music. <laughs> oh, I have released the beast. I'm fearful. I can't fire up a browser. My smoke detector will go off. <laughs> Yeah, it's Linux. Changes all the time. Yeah, I can't. I'll, I'll, like I said, I, I will fix that archive document uh, and change out the uh, the instructions to wget. I, I know what they did, and if I cared, I would confirm it by going to do a, another experiment. But I got to wipe all this out and build a fresh server, and all for the sake of doing that simple experiment. Nah, we know what works. I'll just document that this was the way that was created in the tutorial. Don't use it. It doesn't work. Something has changed. However, this is the recommendation from citadel.org, and it worked in our lab. I don't mind typing. I do mind rebuilding a whole server because it takes an hour just to build Raspberry Pi OS. There's something interesting I've noticed. Uh, every time Raspberry Pi comes out with a new image, it's complete. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. And so if you install it right then and there, and then you do an update upgrade, a couple things will happen, but it's a five, 10 minute affair. But over time, they change it. But update and upgrade still rely on the old information. And right now to do update upgrade on a fresh install, 
is literally about 50 minutes on my machine. Yours is going to vary based on the speed of your internet link and the speed of your micro SD card or whatever storage card you're using. But uh, I think I haven't tested this lately, but I will this weekend uh, that the fastest way to do an install is to download the most recent image from raspberrypi.org slash downloads to your local machine. And then when you use the Raspberry Pi imager, don't select from the menu, the over link, the, the over internet link, browse for the one you just downloaded. Now I'm not 100% I'm making that all up uh, based on some incomplete observations, but something to look at. What are we doing here? 35, I'm gonna give this five to 10 more minutes. And if it's not done, then we'll pick it up at the beginning. There's only five more minutes of presentation to do after this is done. We got five minutes worth of answering setup questions, and then we connect to it with a browser and we start the configuration and setup stuff for users. And here's where you can change uh, or, or set default SMTP ports, whether you're going to use POP or IMAP. Nobody uses POP. Everybody uses IMAP, you get the idea. All right, reading questions again then whilst we're waiting here. Bilbo, under to go wants to invent a smoke detector. Yeah, get the smoke detector from the same place you got the uh, very successful and powerful cameras that you had such good luck with earlier this year. Hmm. Sorry, drinking a lot, but I'm solving that <clears throat> frog in my throat. Passing 319 on questions, people talking together. <laughs> Your smoke alarm is for cooking, huh? Every now and again, we have that problem here. I open the front door, I open the back door, and get lovely Houston heat blasting through the house in an effort to pull out invisible smoke that's just enough to fire off the smoke detector. Blackened steak. <laughs> Man, remember that whole blackened fat in the 90s? I kind of miss that. It got boring back then, but being able to pull that off now and again would be kind of cool. I super scrolled. How's that possible? There's not that much going on. I am root. <laughs> That'd be cool. A subplanet. You got I am roots and you got I am roots beneath. Okay, first part of that is done. It's now installing Lib Citadel. Checking whether the C compiler works. Marvelous. I didn't watch this when I did it. I ran it on Friday night, Saturday morning, whatever it was, and walked away. And next time I came back to the computer, hours, days later, whatever it was, it was all done and just waiting with questions. <laughs> oh, you've upgraded, Scott. 256 gigs of RAM. That's cool. You know what? I was thinking about that the other day. Uh, you can pick up some very inexpensive dated servers on Craigslist and eBay and things like that. Uh, they were used with uh, Microsoft server products, but you can sometimes, you know, if you want to get to live with DDR3 uh, and a couple of older Xeon processors, those are freaking awesome. You could build a marvelous uh, virtual machine server, just run Linux on there, uh, run VMware, run whatever. Uh, there's a virtual box available for Linux, and then set up all your virtual machines. And then you can set up dozens of them that are all running simultaneously. And maybe you spend one or 200 bucks on one of these servers uh, and come up with 128 gigs of RAM. And you could really make a party out of it, put it in another room and uh, make sure that all the VMs are set up for remote access. They have their various remote access facilities like VNC or, uh, remote desktop for Windows. I'm actually putting some real thought into that. <clears throat> oh, if my browser crashes the AMD driver randomly, my browser crashes the AMD driver. And I, 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 there's, there's something more coming here. And I shouldn't have started with the word tell of it, but there I am. Of course, the air blowing gently in a north northeast direction makes AMD driver crash randomly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, the AMD video card. Okay. Hmm. 
debating sharing what's going on with you here every now and again you see something green which it means it's going to the next phase so now it's actually installing citadel so it compiled everything and see compiled everything where that was necessary uh but then as soon as it got, that goes off screen then it's just list of stuff checking 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 here i'll throw it up so you can watch it and i'll read questions while i'm doing that one of the nice things is at least so far it uh has not done one of those things where it freezes forever and you wonder is it really going on buzz 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 grind 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 okay going back to this All right, picking up at 3.30, jealousy noises. <laughs> yes, he was kidding. It'd be bigger than one of my SSDs. <laughs> Project Gemini. Well, other than the space program, which Project Gemini are you talking about, Maven? It was the other server that was making the noise. <laughs> Yeah, the one with the burner on it. Hey, look, pretty purple things. Warnings. That's okay. Uh, is that GB or <laughs> megabytes? I would love to have 64 gig of RAM. Me too. I would be happy with that. But I hardly ever multitask more than a game and a, and a YouTube video. And I never have more than like four tabs open. Okay, so let me tell you about an engineering axiom uh, elbow. Systems expand to fill space available. If you had 64 gigs of RAM, you would fill it just as full as you are currently occasionally filling your four gigs. Uh, to have it is to use it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, you just upgraded your sister's build. Is that the one that you were doing this build for all along? It was your sister? I was under the impression it was a friend. Bought another stick of RAM to be upgraded to 16 gigs, and she installed it by herself. Way to go. Outstanding on, on her part, wherever she learned it from. Kudos. And she's not a tech person. Very good. That's, that's very impressive. How many RAM slots do you have? Kudos to your sister. Hey, <laughs> I think we're all on the same page here. Got four slots. So you have 432 or a pair of 64s. Who's... Oh. He doesn't actually have 128. I don't know if he does. Who knows? He might. Root Society exists. It's mostly underground. I already did that. Come on. Been thinking about doing that yourself, Andrew. I'm with you. Yes, he was joking. <laughs> Just 32 gigs of RAM for Scott. That'd be so cool, though. 32 is the sweet spot right now. Yeah, that's that's pretty much true. I think on the consumer level, 16 is. Uh, at the geek level, 32 is and then you once you hit 64 you're in the uber geek the rarefied worlds downloading websit that's okay that's done 95 percent installing websit oh, so the, the websit that's going to be our web management interface so we have near the end there how are we doing here it's 43. That was a good conversation. Everybody's on it here. Need a full upgrade next, holding off for a couple months to avoid stickers. You can't hold off for a couple months, Scott. Christmas is almost here. Christmas stuff is out at a store I was in sometime in the last week or so. And that store already had more Christmas stuff than Halloween stuff. Maven project that removes browsers. Browsers are inefficient, trying to multitask too many things. <laughs> Did a build with a friend a while back. That's the one that wouldn't post. Okay, after transporting my sisters was the most recent. So I presume since we haven't heard anything about this in a while, that you finally got that friend's installation done. Uh, what was the problem? I mean, can you boil that down into simple, something quick and simple and fun? Hey, setting up iCal time today. Come on, you. I'm getting bored. 
I fear we're not going to get to this. I'm at at 50. I will abandon this and we will complete it next Friday. But as I said, it's there's almost but what would be cool is uh, the thing that I was going to do next Friday, we will still do. This will take five to 10 minutes out of our life at the beginning of it to finish this project and then move on to project next. Uh, and I haven't decided 100% which one, you know what I did? No, I know that I've got to do two more uh, AMAs on webmail and I hadn't decided what the order was going to be. I think what I'm not going to do is how to expose it to the internet. So I'm not going to do a DDNS episode. I've kind of already done that. Not going to do a uh, certificate episode. Kind of already done that. Uh, maybe down road here, but that stuff is really easy to find on your own with tutorials. Uh, if you just go to no IP, they'll walk you, talk you through how to set up DDNS on your system. And same goes for Let's Encrypt. In fact, if you go to Let's Encrypt, uh, there's a script that you download and it's really cool. It, you run that and it installs in your uh, whatever computer you're using, your Linux machine, your whatever. And that script runs automatically every 30 days and keeps your certificate installed and updated and whatever. And remember, Let's Encrypt has free certificates. They only let you have three free ones. So use them judiciously, but how cool, right? So if you wanna set up a, like mine, a, an in-house web server, I put a certificate on that. You wanna build your own externally available email server. There's a certificate. You'll need a different certificate for each server. And in theory, you could do both of those servers on the same machine, but they'll still need different certificates. It's doing something, connecting to Citadel server, playing with sim links and making a service. Nice. All right, reading more questions here. 344, same thing. Okay. Under the glare, we need, hey, all right, error. Setup couldn't connect to running Citadel server, no such file. Press return to continue. I'm just gonna hit return and see what it does here. Click, click. Ah, oh, I hate Linux. God, how I hate Linux. It was so close to done. Citadel easy install is aborting the last few lines above this message may indicate what went wrong. Couldn't connect to a running Citadel server. Oh, we may have to reboot. My terrible fear is I'm gonna to have to run the whole install again, but let's try the reboot. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna reboot this server right now and I'm gonna start the install again with wget from scratch and then we'll pick it up wherever it leaves off on Monday. So let me get this rebooting. God, that's pathetic. Reboot. And then let's see if I saved the wget command. I don't think I copied and pasted anything else after that. Pick up next Friday. Yeah, not next Friday, not Monday. Thanks. Good. I saved the wget command. That's a good sign. I don't know where I got Monday from. Next week is a busy, busy week. I got to finish that project for the company by this week. You'll give me a new project on Monday. I got that project that I'm working on every night for 30 hours a week that's not working and all kinds of other goodies going on. What are we doing here? 48. Okay, I got a couple minutes. I'm waiting for this to, to reboot and get the process started again. Give me a second. All right, server's back up. You can't see it because it's not much point. Stand by. Got to paste in the wget command. And we had to pipe that through sudo bash. And off she goes. Tell me off you go. There we go. Pretty blue steps. Yes. Yes, capital Y. Have you performed a full backup of your programs? No, but we'll say yes. Do you want easy install to attempt to install your OS dependencies? Yes. Now, the good thing about this is it should say, 
I'll read that in a moment on the back channel. Do you want easy install? I'm just going to say yes. It should say, oh, you've already got this dependency. You got that one and speed things up. Yeah, I just saw a bunch already installed, already installed. Things are happening quick. Okay. So I'm just going to let that do its thing in the background and we will pick this up on Friday. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Connecting to Citadel server. Hey, we are right where we wanted to be. Please enter the name of the Citadel user account. All right. It just needed a reboot. Well, that's got to be built into the instruction, doesn't it? I'll share with you in a second here. I'm just fixing something for my notes later. Pseudo. Okay, save that. Now share. Oh, okay. I see what's going on. Sorry, I was just looking at the instructions. All right. So here's the last steps that have to be done from the text interface, from the command line. He wants to know the name, we talked about this, of the Citadel user account that should be the administrator. And we said by default, it's admin. So it says enter the new value or press return to leave unchanged. I will press return. And same thing or password. The password is Citadel. It's all lowercase, C-I-T-A. And a new value or press return to leave unchanged. We'll leave it unchanged. This is currently set to, oh, okay. So here's the user. So this I want to change. I don't want to use root. So I'm going to use my friend Pi. And his default account. Oh, wait, please specify IP address the server should be listening to. You can name, okay, so this one I didn't explain to you earlier. Uh, you can specify a, a singular IP address, or if you just leave their star at anything, it'll listen on any IP address. Seems kind of weird, but enter to leave it unchanged. That's what I want. And TC4 that your server is going to run on. Normally it's 504. Okay. So this is not email ports. This is server management ports. So 504 is fine. And here's that authentication message. We're going to do self-contained authentication, zero. We're not hooking up to LDAP or directory services. And we don't have an integrated authentication system, so enter. And now we do the reconfiguring. Now he does restart. Hey, this is it. Stopping all web server. Which HTTP port do you want to use for WebSit 80? Because I don't have another web server in here. 443 for HTTPS. And we're done. The server is up. It's running. And all we have to do is configure it for users and things like that with a web interface that just points to the IP address of this computer, which is, when I use it locally, come here, you, 192.168.1.105. So we'll pick that up on next Friday. I'm done with this. Do the last questions here for seven or eight more minutes. And voila. And I will include two sets of information in here about rebooting the server when it errors out. Pseudo bash, reboot the server when it errors out at the end because can't find running Citadel instance. Then run the wget again. It will be fast and finish up. Okay, notes are done. Back to Q&A. Shrink you, see you. Oh, you know what? I'm going to do a, a refresh on this page because whenever I do those long things, as you may recall. It gets way behind. I was still looking at server stuff.
waiting, waiting, waiting. Meantime, I can look at my notes here. All right, we'll put a big asterisk here. Pick up here. And again, I will put all of those updated instructions in the archive document in a couple hours, uh, and it'll be available all weekend for you to download. Or maybe you were crazy and took notes while we did this. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anybody do that. Control S. Okay, I'm back in, oh, well, that was just weird and a half, but we can fix that. Kill this, pop this out. Set it back to live chat, right? Pick up at the end. Cool, we got five minutes left. It's just right. We could probably open up a browser page and do this just that fast, but I would rather talk to you for five more minutes. Live chat. All right. I'm back in biz. Where'd we leave off here? I see fractal notes. I had nothing to do with those. Ooh, lots of stuff has happened. Okay, smart move is where I left off. They build with friends. I need to choose between more RAM and a new laptop. Hard to choose. New laptop with more RAM, obviously. Oh, yeah, Scott posted something on the back channel here. Okay, good. Yeah, I was just we're getting that question now. So, Kate Brown. Welcome, Kate Brown. What type of cabling is typically used to connect workstations to wall jacks? Uh, so typically, it's going to be unshielded twisted pair, and this being the year 2021, it's going to be a straight through cable, so it's going to have the same wire colors on pins one through eight on one end as the other, and it will probably be category 5E cable that supports gigabit. It'll be stranded wire because it's in an area where wires get moved and unstranded wire solid wire uh, the more you move it it's it's a little bit brittle and it can snap but stranded core stranded wires are much more flexible well why don't we just always use one over the other well because uh the solid core actually transmits better it's got more reliable connections it's speedier it has less resistance to it uh, but we, it's only safe to put in areas where it won't be moved, like in walls and things like that, because it would break uh, under the eternal movements and wigglings that we get in exposed areas. And so while stranded wire isn't as good for that kind of thing, for uh, transmission capability, it's good enough, and it's much more tolerant of wiggling and jiggling. I hope that helps. Over four months, we went through every part of this order, replaced motherboard twice, and da, 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 test another, bought another speaker, error speaker, speaker flagged RAM errors, replaced RAM, finally replaced CPU, and that fixed it. Okay. It was the grand, uh, probably Cat 6. Okay. Could be Cat 6. Or multi-mode if you're using fiber. It's true. You, you There was assumptions. I assumed that you were in a wired network uh, that's gigabit. Stranded UTP, unshielded twisted pair, cat 5e or better. Okay, everybody's throwing in their things and they're all correct. 5e is a good, if you're talking about a copper wired network, 5e is fine and, and any cats higher than that is fine and deals with future growth. What type of network is large enough to have backbone cabling? Same thing. If you're talking about going to the wall jack, just local stranded STP. If you're talking to yeah, from the computer, her follow up on backbones, right? So the backbone stuff, that's going to be solid core uh, and or fiber optic, depending on your network. Looking at Fractal Designs Focus G right now, looking like a good option for airflow, looks in space. Okay. I have a particular reason that I have to play with airflow. I'm working on a project and it mandates airflow. Reading questions as we get to the last minute or so here. Tell you what, I'm just going to read real quickly and see if there's anything really critical. Feed's been solid. 
Elwood, Kate Brown, same, unless it's fiber, right. Heat management is an art. Elwood, uh, I like that NZXT line of cases. They got some good stuff. All right, one last question here. We'll run a little bit long What we deal with Maven at 356. What could be the reason the pics on my iPhone is showing as empty in Fedora? Sometimes it happens on Windows when the memory is full, maybe tolerance of memory is less. I'm going to leave that to an iPhone guru, but I will tell you that for the brief time that I switched to iPhone out of kind of a necessity, um, I used the default settings on the camera and then pictures I was taking, and it didn't make standard JPEG images. It made its own proprietary things, and I had to get uh, a proprietary viewer, and then I came to understand that I could change the settings on the pictures it was taking. So check the format. Uh, and the output on there. What the heck is going on there? Kate got a whole bunch of deleted messages. Somebody looks like the Ben Hammer was at work. Okay, thank you, Scott. Well, we're going to wind things up here. Let me get this thing set up and this thing set up. I'm not going to talk about lists of next week. Next week, we're going to do more email servers. As always, my my internal gratitude to Mike and to Scott, uh, Scott for his incredible yeoman service as he works the back channel. And man, the, the chat's just exploding. Sorry, I'm not going to get to it today. Uh, I'll, I'll read some of that stuff, follow it up on Monday or on Friday, or you can ask again on Monday. I am David Rush, senior instructor at Total Seminar, resident pie specialist. I wish you a great weekend. Take care of each other. Take serious steps to take uh, stay healthy. Can't speak today. Call or visit your parents and family. And never forget, technology is great, but the greatest resource we have are you and I. And with that, good night. I'll see you on Discord in a few minutes. AMA next week. And until then, I am out of here. <laughs>